Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're going to give everyone a, another minute or two to join into the webinar, and then we will get started here. All right. Um, well, like I said, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, welcome everyone to our webinar, Pathways to Net Zero, a multidimensional approach to carbon neutrality. My name is Michelle Winters. I'm VP of Solutions at Gobi, and I'll be the moderator for today. Our webinar will focus on reducing carbon emissions and achieving carbon neutrality across your real estate organization. Our speakers will share their experiences and provide insights into planning for 2021 and beyond best practices for setting attainable, effective net zero carbon goals, and strategies for achieving net zero targets, both at the portfolio-wide and the asset level. So before we begin, I'd like to introduce our speakers for today's webinar. So Marta Shantz is leads the Urban Land Institute Greenprint Center, a worldwide alliance of leading real estate owners, investors, and strategic partners committed to improving the environmental performance of the global real estate industry. And through measurement, benchmarking, knowledge sharing, and implementation of best practices, Greenprint and its members strive to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 50% um, by 2030. And Gobi is very proud to be a ULI partner. I also have joining with us Kylie Ford, is one of our principal ESG consultants here at Gobi, where we are focused on helping businesses establish, monitor, and communicate ESG initiatives through our ESG platform. Kylie has over a decade of ESG management consulting and program experience, and is an expert at bridging multiple roles focused on employee engagement, strategic business development, and process improvements. And last but certainly not least, we have Natalie Tier, VP of Sustainability and Social Impact at Hudson Pacific Properties a real estate investment trust with a portfolio of office and studio properties totaling 19 million square feet. Hudson Pacific recently achieved 100% carbon neutrality across all of their operations in 2020. I'm personally excited to hear more about that today. <laughs> so we'll be starting with brief presentations from Kylie and Marta and then an interview with Natalie and then questions um, for all of our speakers. So the last thing I'll mention before we get started is please feel free in the bottom right corner um, to submit any questions throughout the entire presentation, and we'll get to them as many as we can at the end. Thank you so much, and Kylie, take it away. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, if, you, if you're on the line now, you, you probably have already heard a bit about net zero, but we thought it was important to just uh, establish what the background is and what we mean when we're talking about net zero. Uh, so truly, we're talking about a math problem here. We're talking about the amount of greenhouse gas produced and the amount removed from the atmosphere. Uh, so trying to balance the equation, we reach net zero when the amount we add is no more than the amount taken away. But amount added of what and taken away from what, this harkens back to what I'm sure you've seen before, the greenhouse gas effect. Our planet has unique properties in that it has a very nice atmosphere that allows us to keep a lot of the sun's warmth and energy that comes in so that we have a habitable cli climate. Uh, but the thing is, this is done via a layer of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere that sort of act as a blanket. Now, because of human activity, we also produce energy in a way that emits greenhouse gases. Uh, and basically, the blanket that we have now is just a little bit thicker than it's supposed to be, and it's heating us up. So that's what global warming is. Uh, but when we say greenhouse gases, you know, you hear a lot about us talking carbon offset, carbon neutrality, net zero carbon. We're talking about more than just carbon dioxide itself. There's several different greenhouse gases. The Kyoto Protocol in the 90s outlined six major ones. You've probably heard carbon dioxide, methane, and uh, nitrous oxide is the three most common. There's also the HFCs, the hydrofluorocarbons, uh, sulfur hexfluoride, and, and so on. Um, but why, why do we only talk about carbon then? Well, it would become really complicated if we were trying to say, okay, we need exactly this level of methane in our atmosphere, exactly this level of carbon. What we've done in, in the industry and across the board is we look to compare the two you. You've maybe heard that methane is 25 times more warming than carbon. That's true in the sense of it has the capacity to capture and retain heat 25 times better than carbon dioxide does. So what we do is rather than saying, okay, here's your methane emissions, here's your nitrogen trifluoride emissions, 
we justify that all in terms of what is its global warming potential as carbon dioxide. Let's pretend it's all tons of carbon dioxide or carbon dioxide equivalency. So when we say net zero, we are talking about the whole greenhouse effect. Uh, and when we say carbon, it's really this conception of carbon as sitting in our atmosphere. When we're looking to actually reduce what we're doing, uh, and as in making the blanket the appropriate level of thickness to keep us the appropriate level of warm so that we're not increasing the global temperature too much, there's really four dimensions aspects to consider. You can avoid emissions, and when I say carbon, I mean greenhouse gas in general, but avoiding emissions entirely means, let's say you own a corporate jet. Avoiding it, you don't use it on this day. Maybe this meeting that you thought you had to have in person, you can look to have virtually. That's one example of avoiding it. You just don't even engage in the activity that would emit carbon into the atmosphere or the greenhouse gases. You can reduce. Uh, this is where we talk about a lot of uh, efficiency operations. For instance, if you have better building insulation, you don't need as much energy so that you can keep your building as warm and comfortable to be in in the winter. Uh, that's one example of reducing. You could also look to switch. Uh, so maybe you're utilizing a fuel source that's a bit more intense. Uh, a car that um, utilizes gasoline to run produces more greenhouse gases than an electric car. Uh, similarly, you could look to switch entirely to something that is carbon neutral, such as solar or wind energy off of a traditional electricity source. And then the, finally, the last uh, aspect to consider is offsetting. And this is really the case for emissions that cannot otherwise be reduced or avoided or switched in any way. Maybe your market doesn't support exactly what you wanna do, or you don't have the capital funds to immediately get away from all of your emissions. What is offsetting? Well, it means that as you continue to produce emissions, you can purchase offset units that then cancel out these emissions. That is to say, your dollars fund projects that engage in activities that reduce the greenhouse gases in our atmosphere. So an example of a project that it might fund is, is efforts to restore forests or maybe fertilized soil efforts. These things act as carbon sinks. Like we know that trees eat carbon dioxide and breathe out oxygen, for instance. Uh, so that might be the type of project that your dollars are going towards. And there's some very complicated math behind understanding exactly what dollar contribution you would need to do to offset your level of emissions to equal out to what you're funding. But that's generally how offsets work. So that was very specific sciencey talk for what we even mean when we're saying carbon neutral. Why are we talking about it here? And, and what does it mean for your business? What we're seeing is that across the board, there is an increased interest from investors. It's not good enough anymore just to say, here's what our carbon footprint is. You have to now say, here's what we're doing about it. Here's what our ultimate goal is and what our vision is for reducing the carbon emissions. Uh, we're seeing this crop up too on voluntary ESG disclosure frameworks. Uh, things like GRESB, UNPRI, there's questions that are not just about what is your usage, what are your admissions, but how do you assess climate risk and where do you see this going? What are your policies do to support your efforts? Uh, we're also in a changing regulatory environment and uh, we'll get to exactly why in just a second, uh, but there's emerging legislation where you might be required to be reducing your carbon emissions, maybe at the municipal level, maybe at, at the national level. Uh, and then finally, we're seeing a competitive advantage. It's it's not just investors that are asking about your carbon neutral efforts. Uh, tenants would prefer to lease in spaces that are carbon neutral. Even prospective employees would wanna be joining companies that have made this uh, part of their business strategy. So just drilling a bit into our, our changing regulatory environment, a lot of what is happening now harkens back to the Paris Climate Accord. It was agreement in 2015 that was basically a, meant to be a binding international treaty on climate change. Uh, and it's been ratified in 188 countries as of November with uh, the US of course slated to rejoin the end of this month. And the idea behind the Paris Climate Accord is that we cannot allow the global temperature to rise more than two degrees Celsius over pre-industrial levels, with the real target being only a 1.5 degree increase. Uh, that is what we see as being necessary to prevent a lot of, you know, the more disastrous things that you've probably heard about climate change, rising sea levels, disappearing uh, countries entirely, water shortages, all that kind of stuff. 
Uh, so a growing number of countries have made a commitment onto the Paris Climate Accord. So EU ministers, for instance, have determined that they need to hit carbon neutrality by 2050 to make sure the goals of the Paris Climate Accord are realized. There's other countries too. We're not just talking about the European market. Japan has, has 2050 net zero goals. I think uh, Canada has a, a legislation in draft form right now that's going to be targeting this. We're also seeing cities join the call. New York City, Boston, they also have net zero targets set for 2050. Uh, and then in addition, businesses are beginning to support on their own right. So businesses using science-based targets initiative, which again is centered around making sure we don't see a global temperature increase of more than 1.5 degrees Celsius, have used that to set the framework for their emissions reductions. So whether you're a business, you can see your activity actually impact and uh, fall in line with the Paris Climate Accord. And just to show you an idea of the, the amount of steam that this has been gaining, we're seeing voluntary targets crop up more and more. Uh, none of these companies are required by regulation yet to be setting these, but we do see uh, big player names and utility companies racing to declare net zero targets, uh, particularly with that 2050 data as being the agreed upon uh, crucial time period. So that, that was the very broad strokes of why we're here, why it's important. Uh, I'm now going to turn the microphone over to Marta, who's going to be discussing a little bit more about strategy and projects in particular. Wonderful. Uh, thank you, Kylie, for setting up that excellent background on net zero. I think it's, it's, it's just the right uh, place to have me talk a little bit more about net zero and specific for real estate. So again, my name is Marta Shams. Great to be here today. I'm the Senior Vice President for ULI's Greenprint Center for Building Performance. And for those who aren't familiar, ULI or the Urban Land Institute is a, a global real estate industry group. We have over 45,000 members across the world with the mission of responsible use of land through creating and sustaining thriving communities. So naturally, uh, green buildings fits into that quite nicely. And, uh, and I lead Utilize research arm focusing on the business case for green buildings. We cover topics ranging from city and real estate uh, climate policy to sustainable tenant fit outs to embodied carbon to net zero and everything in between. So here we can go to the, the next slide. Oh, I have control of that. And uh, in addition to our research work, you will like green print. As, as Michelle mentioned, includes a, a network, a, a community of practice with leading real estate owners, investors, and partners committed to reducing uh, the impact of, of buildings on the environment with that 50% by 2030 reduction goal and newly announced a, a net zero carbon operations by 2050. Uh, just like Kylie was saying, another another group um, attaching to that, to that 2050 target date to align with, with what science is telling us. So we have over 45 uh, real estate members who, who are a part of the Green Print community of practice across the globe. And we also partner with, with data providers like Gobi to enable tracking and measurement and improvement towards, towards the goals listed here. And so we work with our, our members on all sorts of wonky topics and we take those best practices and promote them to the broader market. So on this next slide, I wanted to show some of our, our green print members where we continue to grow. And you can see um, Natalie, your company is listed here, Hudson Pacific Properties. She's also speaking on the webinar, of course. Um, over the past 10 years since green print has been founded, our members continue to find that reducing carbon, driving energy efficiency in their real estate portfolios, it just makes good business sense. It, the financials are sound. And so um, to date toward that 50% by 2030 goal, uh, year over year, our members have reduced 34%. So we are on track to meet it. And based on that, you know, that 50% by 2030 isn't enough. Based on where we're at today, what the market is telling us, we needed to raise the bar. And so we set uh, that net zero goal for net zero carbon operations by 2050 for our collective portfolio. It's a longer term goal, and it continues to show how, how these sustainable changes can add value to properties. It aligns with the, the Paris Agreement, as Kylie was talking about, from the IPCC report to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees. Beyond just the, the fact that the time is now, I wanted to reinforce what Kylie was saying about why net zero is important. First and foremost, there's always that financial business case. You've lower your operating expenses, lower your maintenance and repairs, increase your net operating income and increase asset value. So at the building level alone, the financial business case is there. Additionally, though, investors are valuing this. Tenants are asking for it. There's a need for grid and energy reliability uh, improvements and, and confidence. 
and also regulations are coming, whether it's, as Kylie was saying, at the municipal level or at the state or countrywide level, um, this is this is on your radar. So for risk avoidance and to be proactively preparing for what's coming for the real estate market, net zero is important to be thinking about. So we set this goal, this net zero by 2050 goal, and 11 of our members so far have publicly aligned with that goal. Uh, in total, they represent over $215 billion in assets under management, over 500 million square feet, almost 3,000 properties across 20 countries. So it's it's a it's a big starting group, and we expect a lot of fast followers. Natalie, I, I figured I would tap your shoulder. Do you want to chime in on, on Hudson Pacific being a part of this? Yeah, well, it's funny. Right around this time that Marta was developing this call um, was exactly when we were finalizing our carbon neutrality. Um, and so I, we were kind of trading phone calls at the same time of like, hey, I'm going to be announcing this just FYI. And she was like, well, perfect timing because we want to do this ULI movement. And so from our perspective, this is so great. Um, you know, a lot of what Kylie and Marta have been talking about around the, the science that's aligned with the Paris Agreement, that's really important. But you have to think about it from the macro level. Like that's how the world that's an accomplishment the world needs to move towards. And there are going to be leaders and laggards in there. And so we, we know whenever you have a goal, some people don't meet it, which means other people have to go above and beyond in order for us to land where we need to land. And we, because of who we are um, as a business and our values, we felt a real responsibility to lead. And I, I know that all, all the other companies on this page share that feeling. Awesome. Thanks, Natalie. So when we think about achieving net zero at at first blush it seems like this insurmountable huge challenge but when you break it up into its components it's it's actually quite doable and as natalie i'm sure we'll talk about feasible as well in today's economic environment uh, first and foremost when we think about a roadmap to portfolio-wide net zero carbon energy efficiency uh, it, it is the most cost effective solution for for carbon reductions and we stand by that uh, from there, we've moved to thinking about on-site renewable energy so that it's immediately on-site and you have that direct value to, to offset the, the usage that you have, which Kylie was talking about with that definition of net zero. From there, we start thinking about green utility power and sourcing off-site renewables from, from the utility grid directly, while also electrifying buildings so that you don't have to rely on natural gas to, to skew your, your work there. And then we balance the remaining emissions with offsite renewables, renewable energy credits, and, and other carbon offsets. With that total, that's how, how ULI Greenprint is looking at net zero. However, we don't want to ignore the other facets that, that play into net zero and, and overall building emissions like tenants. Uh, tenants comprise well over half of any building's carbon emissions, and to ignore them forever is, is missing part of the problem. And so we know that tenants are important, and we continue to focus on that. And we also are thinking about embodied carbon because the embodied emissions of building materials themselves and materials from fit outs throughout the life cycle of a building are also a significant portion of a building's life cycle carbon emissions. And so thinking about how the real estate community can eventually reduce those as well is part of our scope. Now, when we think about zero carbon and net zero for real estate specific, there are some tricky nuances. First off, tenants, right? In real estate, you don't occupy your buildings, you have tenants, and so there is that natural separation in terms of those operational boundaries. So when, when we're thinking about net zero, we, we calculate it in terms of what's under operational control of the, of the owner. So definitely scope one and scope two, that's under your control. So we, we don't include triple net tenants, for example, in our, our baseline definition. It's also tricky because in real estate, there are a number of acquisitions and dispositions that complicate your totals. And so when we think about what is net zero at any point in time, depending on what what the building makeup is of your portfolio, your totals could be different. So the way that we calculate it, and we do have that 2050 deadline, at any point in time, we look at if a building has been acquired, we give a 24 month grace period to, to get it before it gets included in the calculations to give time for the new owner to spruce it up and, and get it a little more efficient, and more, more carbon neutral. And for dispositions, as soon as their sale date hits, uh, it's, it's removed from the total. And that's how we're, we're calculating that too. Additionally, it, it, this is an absolute goal. It's not like a certain percentage reduction. So no matter how much a portfolio grows or 
or reduces in size, uh, we just want the, the tally to hit zero. We want to hit that zero, and that's what we're looking at. And then lastly, there is a bit of a chicken and egg situation when it comes to the greening of the grid. Do you wait and just assume that your utility grid will be all renewable and hats off to you? Or do you do the work early on, get your building prepared so it doesn't need as much energy in the first place and it can have lower carbon emissions overall? We, we say both is the answer. And so we encourage action on energy efficiency and renewables, no matter the grid quality across the portfolio. Real quickly, I wanted to give two examples from some of our Greenprint members who have done some great work on this. And the first is a single net zero building as opposed to a full portfolio. It, the property is called Boulder Commons. It's a two building multi-tenant office property in Boulder, Colorado. It has new construction and it is net zero. It has normal tenants. There's a hair salon in there. There's also a, a mission driven nonprofit, but uh, Nonetheless, this is a, a multi-tenant net zero building, and it was done with only a 12% incremental cost to, to get to that net zero achievement. It has a number of off-the-shelf components like narrow floor plates, variable volume refrigerant system, uh, composite steel structure, triple glazed windows, a good thermal envelope, um, LED lighting, and then it also has really creative solutions like solar cladding. The, the bottom two photos here and even the one on top, you can see that on the side, there are all those, those kind of black looking items. Those, those are solar panels just on the side of the building, which Natalie has at one of her buildings as well. Um, but doing the solar analysis and saving money by putting solar panels on the wall instead of siding, it, it actually changes the, the financials of the project. And additionally, there are some interesting creative solutions for, for tenants because it is a multi-tenant triple net building. Uh, each tenant has to sign a green lease with a plug load allowance where if they use more energy than they are committed to, they have to buy renewable energy credits to balance their totals out so that the building can stay true to its net zero goal. Um, this is a, a commercial asset. It was developed on spec with only one tenant confirmed out of the whole. And, and we think we're gonna see a lot more of this over time. And lastly, I wanted to talk about a, a portfolio example. Another one of our green print members is Tower Companies. Here's just a, a sample of their mini buildings. They've got about uh, a little over 5 million square feet of, of mixed use uh, commercial building types in the DC, Maryland, Virginia area. And back in 2010, their, their C-suite made a commitment to annually offset 100% of their commissions. That's scope one, that's scope two, and that's scope three travel. So it's a significant piece there. And they have not stopped there. They think they can do more. So they've been pushing on energy efficiency to make their buildings as efficient and reduce those carbon emissions on site. They've been adding on site renewables to existing buildings where it makes sense with roof space. And they've been thinking about other ways to prioritize and deepen and be more aggressive on sustainability with buying local recs as opposed to wind from Texas, to thinking about um, utility green power, exploring offsite PPAs and more. So they, they've been able to do this for the past 10 years. And I think we're going to be seeing a lot more companies drive on this as well. So with that, I, I'd love to pass it back to, to Michelle and Natalie to talk about what's going on at Hudson Pacific. Awesome. Thank you so much for that, Marta. That was really fantastic overview. And I think just for the time being, maybe, um, Chris, are you able to stop sharing your screen? We'll get our pictures up. There we go. I think that worked. Um, so uh, perfect. The, uh, so for the next few minutes, um, I'll be interviewing with uh, Natalie here and asking her a little bit more about the work that she's done um, for the carbon neutrality with Hudson Pacific. Um, specifically, Natalie, I you know I realized the other day that I I wasn't aware of this, but your original goal was to be net zero by 2025, um, and <laughs> you managed to move that ahead five years, which is pretty amazing. Um, so I'd love to maybe just for the rest of our viewers how first question is really like how did you get started and how did you re kind of bump that up here um to, to make that happen way ahead of schedule sure um well it's probably helpful to start with a little description of who hudson pacific is because we uh, have an advantage to be totally frank over a lot of other owners and operators in that we are a west coast rate we focus on urban centers from LA up to Vancouver. We focus, serve primarily creative media and tech tenants. 
who share our commitment to sustainability. So because of that, the clients we serve and the markets we're in and that the type of talent that we're seeking to attract all the time, you know, sustainability is, is really key. And so where it, many people who have my job at other companies, you know, it's, it's an uphill battle to prove a business case for sustainability for us. I think we, our leadership from the board and the CEO on the, all the way down really sees that it's a virtuous cycle, that the more we invest in sustainability and lead on sustainability, the better it helps us achieve our business objectives, helps us attract the tenants we want, attract the talent we want, get ahead of the regulations, all the business case items we've all just been discussing, um, which is great. So we have about, as you mentioned, about 9, 19, 20 million square feet from across our portfolio. Um, we've been in, and we, we've gone along the journey across that portfolio, the journey that Marta laid out, those um, those six steps and really the four that lead up to net zero carbon and then two more. We're, we're doing work in all of those. And, and we started with energy efficiency um, and our portfolio for the most part is a relatively modern portfolio or they are um, you know, buildings from the 70s or 80s that we have refurbished. And so we've, we've got pretty great um, energy use intensity and energy performance across the portfolio. I think our latest numbers are we're at somewhere near 70% of our square footage is Energy Star certified and 80% um, as of last month is LEED certified, which is, is like way higher than most companies. So that this is yeah. just the investments we've made is just par part of the business. We have invested a lot um, of capital and an operating attention into being as energy efficient as possible. We also have direct contracts with utilities for green power at some of our properties. For example, we own the Ferry Building in San Francisco, and that building has been 100% green power for years, well before we even purchased it. Um, we have other buildings similarly where that are on green power agreements. Um, we do have on-site renewables um, at some of our, specifically in our LA portfolio at several buildings there, um, but there was still a lot of room for improvement. And so what happened, that our real journey started about two years ago when we said, you know, we really want to start moving towards net zero. And the first thing we did was convert the entire portfolio, portfolio um, anything that wasn't already on green power, we converted it to 100% renewable electricity by um, purchasing RECs, essentially, which are like and renewable energy credits. Um, ours were from a wind farm in Texas. We did that in 2019. That brought our carbon footprint down by about 80%, because most of our emissions were scope, one, scope two. Um, then last year, we, and, and then we had a five-year plan to tackle the other 20%, which is all from natural gas. Um, and you know the large focus on electrification, which can't happen overnight, it's gonna take time. But then frankly, what happened is A, wildfires in California, where we're headquartered, got, we're getting, it was a, a truly personal wake up call for a lot of us in, the, in our leadership team. Um, and then COVID. And we realized that to keep our buildings safe, we were gonna have to run the HVAC systems longer and harder than we ever had before. Um, we upgraded all of our filters. We we're trying to pull in outside air, which means you have to you know, do more conditioning. And we were like, well, now we've converted to renewable electricity. We've made this big investment. We have this plan for our carbon emissions to keep going down over time. But what happens if our energy use skyrockets? We can't have our carbon footprint go up. Like that's just a non-starter. So we said, let's just pull that strategy forward. Let's just get there faster. And so the way we did that, um, because that the only way to get there really quickly is through offsets, is we, we purchased offsets, carbon offsets from a landfill gas to energy project. We, we can go into details about why we chose that project, but um, we liked it for a number of reasons. It was certified by BCS, just the leading certification program. It was from North America, so we knew it was a high quality project. It was a recent, recent vintage year. We felt good about that. And, and it was um, landfill gas, meaning it was natural gas based emissions, which aligned with our objective to offset our natural gas emissions. So we closed that deal. That brought us to net zero, um, which we feel really excited about. But frankly, it would feel like it's just 
it, it is a really big milestone and we do want to celebrate it, but there's so much work still in front of us, so much more that we, we still want to do. Um, that's a bit about how we got to where we are. I mean, it's, it's really interesting too on, and we've talked about this on a previous webinar recently, but just the impacts that COVID has had, I felt like in terms of just putting more of a tangible real life example of the impact that ESG can have positively from, from a business standpoint. Um, and that it has brought to light, you know, more of the S than the G, but also to your point with some of the other natural disaster components that did happen this year, like the Australia fires, we're still in 2020. It's crazy in my mind that seems like five years ago, but um, there's still the, the E side as well. So um, that's really interesting perspective on that front. Um, I'd be curious to know too on, you know, you mentioned there's still like so much that you want to do. What are those next steps? Like what are your key things for 2021, we'll say, since you're already ahead of your 2025 goal, what's you know, the next year or two look like in this journey? We have kind of three key work streams in our carbon strategy now. One is around reducing our reliance on RECs and offsets and converting more to um, and continuing to invest in energy efficiency on site renewables in the um, direct contracts with utilities. Um, we are working to set a science based uh, FBTI aligned target that will essentially reflect our, the, our goal on how to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions before you take RECs and offsets into account. So we're really focused on you know, how do we. Um, how do we tackle those absolute emissions? And the technical terms are location-based emissions, not our market-based emissions. Mm -hmm. um, second is around technology and prop tech. The other um, half of my job is leading ESG. The other half is I lead innovation and technology for um, Hudson Pacific. And we are very interested in um, and have a very active pipeline of various innovation pilots underway across the portfolio. Everything from smart glass and uh, window film to leak detection technology to um, electrification uh, of, you know, boiler electrification um, to things like a tenant app that we rolled out last year that allows us to engage with tenants more and drive energy efficiency and behavior change that way. So we define our kind of approach to innovation and technology pretty broadly. We're making, we're not only piloting the technologies in house, we're also making direct investments in companies we think are exciting and we want to see scale because we think they have solutions that are um, relevant for the entire industry, and we're doing that directly and through our partners um, at Fifth Wall, which is a venture capital firm that um, many, many real estate firms are invested in. Um, and then our third work stream around carbon is, is really focusing on embodied carbon, which Marta mentioned, um, but we see that as so critical and still a really emerging area where the, the science is still very new and the um, industry as in general is still really coalescing to understand what it means and how to tackle it. Um, we, for the last year, year and a half, have required all of our developments and major repositioning projects to measure embodied carbon so we could get a baseline. And through that process of really partnering with our architects and designers and general contractors, we've um, gained some initial learnings that make us think you know, it, it, it's going to be possible to set uh, an embodied carbon reduction target for those projects so that through sustainable design and really intentional material selection, we can um, basically do much lower carbon development than, than the traditional approach. And then um, Marta, since you were kind of called out here a little bit, which I think is perfect timing, I'd love to hear you kind of expand on that. What has been your experience um, on that component and any other suggestions you would have for kind of exploring that further um, that you'd want to comment on? On embodied carbon in particular? Yes, absolutely. So embodied carbon for, for folks who weren't familiar with the term, it's still a pretty emerging term as, as Natalie mentioned. It's the 
it's the embodied emissions from the materials themselves that are going into the, the creation and the transportation and installation of the, the construction of those buildings. So that's like steel and concrete are the two biggest offenders when it comes to embodied carbon and materials. And so there are some really creative and low cost ways to address that, whether it's re using recycled steel, thinking about green or low carbon concrete. And there are tools in the market, like there's an EC3 calculator and there are a community is a practice like the Carbon Leadership Forum where practitioners can go to learn about how to compare materials, how to get cost comparable options, how to do so in a, in a way that's not so overwhelming and, and new, but actually feasible and, and quite simple. And so we're, we're following that as well. Our, our Green Print Center put out a report on embodied carbon just last year. If you, I'm going to plug it now because Michelle, you brought this up. Uh, ULI.org slash embodied carbon. There's a, a public report on how real estate can make the business case for, for reducing that in their building materials. So we, we continue to see some opportunity there. And it's going to be very interesting as we think about benchmarking. It, it's one topic that's very new to, to think about how to calculate the overall embodied carbon of development uh, and of any building. So as folks currently benchmark their operational emissions through energy, waste, water, and the like, uh, I think we're going to see more and more embodied carbon of building materials being benchmarked too, which um, data providers I, I'm sure are, are preparing for. Yeah. Takes it to a whole nother level. I'm on board. <laughs> um, well, fantastic. So I'm going to kind of circle back a little bit too, and just in uh, generalities of kind of each of you and what we've seen um, in really best practices or lessons learned. Is there anything, if you were to go back and do it again, you might approach slightly differently or something for those that are just getting started that are listening to the call that you might recommend? Um, and maybe Natalie, I'll let you start. And I'd love to hear too from Kylie and, and Marta as well. I guess reflecting back, this. There are so many technical considerations to take into account at every step along the journey. Um, and we are a lot smarter on them now than we were two years ago when we started. Um, and you know, there are probably, so for anyone else starting the journey, I would advise try to do as much of the, the research on your, to be really clear on your objectives and do the research on then what the technical criteria mean for those beforehand. So for example, we're members of RE100, which is an um, alliance of many global large companies that are committed to 100% renewable electricity. Um, the technical criteria to comply with that commitment that we hold dearly and we want to meet is actually really different than the criteria to reach net zero carbon. We, we use Ernst & Young, our financial auditors, to audit our carbon figures. And so we work closely with them on that accounting process. And you know, the, as, so as an example is, to reach net zero carbon under the greenhouse gas protocol, you can take credit for the green electricity that is already on the grid. So for example, in a place like Vancouver, where 97% of the electricity on the grid is carbon free, our greenhouse gas emissions are relatively light. However, under RE100, you cannot take credit for green electricity that is already on the grid. So we needed to purchase RECs to meet the RE100 criteria, even though it really didn't help us on the carbon, on our carbon journey. So, um, which which was, was fine. We, we were able to do all of that, no problem, but we that wasn't, immediately apparent to me at least at the beginning of the journey that was something I learned along the way there are countless other examples of ways that I um of things I learned along the way that I probably should have known up front yeah when when we think about the definition of net zero it's one of those complicating complicating questions that there is no perfect answer to everyone has a slightly different definition and what what I've settled on is that that's okay we are all working in the same direction. We are all striving to reduce our carbon emissions, become more energy efficient, reduce our impact on the environment. And if, if everyone has a slightly different definition, but is moving in the same direction, that's what matters most. So whether yeah. it's the world yes. building council definition, the, our green print definition, ASHRAE is coming up with a new 228 standard. Mm -hmm. Any of those are great. Yeah. And that's something to keep in mind. Totally. And our approach is just to try to be as transparent as possible. And we publish our definitions and our numbers and 
you know, in our CR report and we disclose through CDP and we just, you know, we're not trying to mislead anyone and we're trying to do the best we can. And you can't, you can't meet all of the definitions at once. So the best you can do is kind of pick your lane and then be open and honest about it. Absolutely. And the thing I specifically learned, I mean, that I thought was even more prevalent in our conversation today is that there's really like no singular path to achieving it either. Um, and it's kind of a combination of different components that it will get pulled together. And Marta, to your point of it, that's okay. Like we're, we're even, the goal is to get there. It is, it is better to kind of keep the needle moving forward. So um, couldn't agree more. And, and Kylie, anything to kind of add from your end as, as well on that side? Yeah, I mean, I think just building off what, what Natalie was saying about show your work, show your math. I think that's the most important part. One of the biggest stumbling blocks, honestly, is is determining what your carbon footprint is. What's your direct footprint? What's your indirect footprint? It can be complicated to be talking through financial control, operational control. I've worked with clients where I, I have to get into the question of, okay, who actually sets the number on the thermostat in this particular building space so that we know whether that's that's um, can be calculated. So my advice is really just try try and get your arms around that first determine what your scope is of your your full inventory and then from there you can begin even just measuring okay if, if we change this one project what's that result in the carbon you're going to find that you can set targets and understand how much you're able to move it uh, it's pretty much proportional to energy targets as well too uh, but really just get that baseline down that's that's my engineering background speaking but show as much work and as much math as possible I, uh, and just to also, you brought up a, really a point that is near and dear to my heart and for anyone on the line who's um, interested in understanding what companies are doing and is looking at the math and reading the footnotes, um, that is such a key point to look at because many landlords, I mean, there is discretion depending on the financial or operational control you, approach you take on doing the accounting, you can include tenant emissions in your scope one and two numbers or you cannot, you can push them into scope three. That is a huge, like many orders of magnitude difference. We include them. We feel that like, look, we don't control the thermostat and the tenant space, but we control the building. We control the core infrastructure. It's our, it's our responsibility. Um, and so we felt like it was important to be more conservative. We took those emissions on, which make our numbers look bigger. Um, it means there's more emissions for us to manage, but we feel pretty strongly that that's the right thing to do. Um, and but you know, th that's not necessarily something that all landlords will do going forward. So as we see more and more moving to net zero, that's going to be a really important thing to pay attention to. The other thing I would love. Oh, go ahead, Michelle. No, no, no. I, go ahead, Marta. I would love to add in that you know, just getting started is so important. You were asking Michelle, you know, what do you do? It, it's never too late to get started on a net zero journey and to, to join the, the leaders who are already on that path. Um, the thing that, that holds some folks back is cost. They think, oh, buying all those offsets, it must be exorbitantly expensive. It's actually not that bad. Natalie, do you wanna talk about that from, from Hudson Pacific's perspective, or can you? Yeah. <laughs> we, we don't release our actual numbers publicly, but what I will say is um, I was shocked at the range of numbers available in offsets and the, the so there are some you can purchase that are really expensive. There are also others you can purchase that are a fraction of the price and frankly, are the same quality, if not better, depending on what you value. Um, so a lot of the reforestation projects, for example, um, which is really great. I, mean, I, I would love to support reforestation, but most of them are happening in other countries where your insight into the quality of the project and permits is more, uh, more questionable as opposed to um, American-based, North American projects, which um, are often tend to be a lot cheaper. Um, so yeah, it's definitely worth um, looking into the pricing. There's ways to do it pretty cheaply. <laughs> Natalie, you're gonna get a couple emails, I feel like after this, of like, all right, give me the inside information. <laughs> <laughs> we, we used three degrees for, to help us with that deal and I highly recommend them. They were really easy. They got us a lot of quotes and helped us through that process. Awesome. Fantastic. Um, and the only other comment I was going to make too is, you know, the other thing that I think is really beneficial, Natalie, for you and, and your company is that because you're on the West Coast, you also have additional accessibility to that tenant data that you can then compare against too, which I think has been a, 
uh, beneficial. Um, and I do think too, just in the, the growth that we're having of making that tenant data more accessible through additional benchmarking ordinances, it all kind of falls in line so that you can do those calculations um, more effectively. So I just thought that was another nice like West Coast, like you guys are lucky in that perspective, but um, there's other ways too for those that aren't all in on the West side. Um, I mean, the tower well, company's example Marta gave was a great one, all about benchmarking too in most of their jurisdictions. But yeah, and the, the nice thing is, like I said, hopefully we're seeing benchmarking is really increasing. Utility providers are getting that aggregate data more readily accessible. So it's, it's all going hand in hand um, for multiple benefits. Um, so I, I was going to comment really quickly and then um, actually we're, we're somehow getting close in the time. So I'm going to find some of the key questions that we, we started to get here. Um, Marta, there was a question specifically for you and I'm going to read it for the first time out loud. Um, so hopefully I, I do so appropriately, but uh, it was saying that um, this specific company, which is an urban mixed use real estate developer and manager, conducted um, comparisons between natural gas and electric heating. In terms of first and operating costs, we find that natural gas comes out ahead. What are some argument strategies to support a switch to electricity under these circumstances? If you could comment on that. That was a pretty good question. Would love to. Electrification is, is something that, that my team is looking at. We'll be putting a report on it in the first half of the year. So keep an eye out for that. There are a couple of different ways to think about the business case for converting from natural gas. First is, is risk avoidance. We're starting to see um, regulations, especially up and down the West Coast, but even in the suburbs of Boston, we're seeing municipalities set uh, natural gas bans on new construction, and that will eventually apply to existing buildings too. So if you're thinking about future proofing your buildings and preparing for a long term hold or just making sure that a future disposition is, is favorable, natural gas is going to start looking not so great. Um, so there is that inherent risk of, of long term regulations pushing natural gas that way. Additionally, there's an equity play when it comes to, to natural gas, where there is um, it, there's health uh, health concerns, right? Now, burning a fuel on a property uh, has poorer air quality than than an all electric building. And so, if you think about those those value pieces, having healthier space with fewer literal burn natural gas on site, there is um, there's benefit there as well. Additionally, when we think about just the, the overall challenges with natural gas heating versus electric heating, there uh, luckily, there have been some great technology advances where even though natural gas is incredibly cheap, um, electric heating is so efficient that it's starting to prove out where it's becoming more comparable. And so those technology advances are proving out really nicely with heat pumps and, and the like. And then um, I could keep rambling about electrification. I'm curious if, if Kylie or Natalie, you wanna add anything into that? No, I mean, I think you really hit the nail on the head in terms of the direction regulation is moving. A lot of the barrier to acting on any of this in the past, and especially the past decade when this became sort of more prevalent, was that environmental uh, degradation or the carbon intensity of these have been external to the market price. And that's where regulations come in to kind of make a way of, of a market-based approach for accounting for these environmental externalities. So we're seeing the trend away from natural gas through regulations, yes, and then also through the fact that natural gas companies themselves know it's coming and want to be switching to. Utility providers, they want to reduce the amount that they need to provide to you, that it lowers their operational costs. And, and most natural gas companies are being very very uh, future-minded in terms of, well, we want to be delivering energy of some kind, but it might not look like gas in the future because we can see the direction that this needs to move. Um, so I, I really think that's that's the main dynamic, uh, supporting uh, you know electrification. And then even just in terms of, it doesn't have to be an outright ban, but sometimes you will find uh, that there's energy efficiency programs via the utilities that you can participate in. There are more of those on the electricity side of things than on the natural gas side of things, and usually a little bit more bang for your buck in terms of funding some of these projects. Well, I would maybe have a slightly more uh, cautious viewpoint <laughs> on it. I, I think electrification is in many cases still a hard case to make. Um, I agree with all of the things that you're talking about, but the today in most of our jurisdictions, it's a really hard thing, hard thing to make the numbers work. Um, that's changing. That will change for sure. Um, but that's it's it's going to be 
a long road. So I, I agree with the, um, the comment that was submitted. I think it's a really challenging topic. It is, um, and there are also- That's also I mean, perhaps a solution is Vancouver's um, going through its draft climate action plan right now, which has really interestingly a, a carbon tax on building the same way that New, that New York has implemented. They also have um, a natural, uh, na natural gas requirements as part of that. Um, but they do in the draft plan, they are allowing for clean gas essentially um, that their utility is uh, ramping up on and the pricing for that is going down. So that the, you know, the answer may not necessarily be 100% electrification. There are perhaps um, options to reduce absolute scope one emissions that you know, there's a hybrid approach to get there. Uh, scientifically, there there is that drive to, if we completely want to offsite um, energy usage in buildings with, with clean renewable power, technically you can really only do that with electricity. The natural gas heating like doesn't have a, a renewable energy coming into a building to to address that. Uh, we could get into nuances of, of clean gas, but that is um, a, a small market right now. Yeah, but it's, so when but we it's think about the technology, Marta, as opposed to electrify today, it's a really important mm -hmm. way to get there. Yeah, yeah. And, and we're seeing a lot of barriers. I mean, a lot of restaurant tenants aren't ready to, to switch away from their gas top stoves. A lot of multifamily or condo owners aren't ready to get rid of their gas fireplaces or their gas stoves either. So it's uh, by no means is is there a, a big market sway right now but but we see it coming i think 10 years from now yeah we'll, we'll look back and see how fast things change are you telling me i have to figure out how to cook on an electric stove that's my <laughs> oh, electrical medium. <laughs> <laughs> no problem on that front yeah i agree <laughs> um no i think that's perfect and actually there's quite a few questions associated with like how we're leveraging technology and um new solutions that maybe even coming out and there was a few questions associated with i think i saw other like new solar technology new coatings technology um i know uh natalie you had touched on that a little bit um marta and kylie i'm curious to hear if you have anything else that you would add to kind of throw out there that's worth commenting on or natalie anything else specific you wanted to to mention also go ahead <laughs> In terms of exciting new technologies for, yeah. for building sustainability, I would say, gosh, it's it's somewhat invisible, but really sophisticated building automation systems are proving to make a huge difference in the efficiency and optimization of a building's energy consumption. And there are some really impressive algorithms, machine learning, AI type of, of tie-ins with sensors and, and all sorts of gadgets that bring together a very sophisticated building. And I'm very excited about where that's going and how that's going to change the way buildings are are run and operated. Yeah, and even just, a, I guess, a more macro view of that, too, is that utility companies are getting a lot better at metering. Metering in general is getting a lot better. So we have more insight into data. We understand best how to distribute things. Uh, the way our energy grid is set up right now, if every single person woke up at 3 a.m. and decided to flip on their lights, they could. That's obviously over-serviced. We do not need that much energy being distributed at all times. So this metering technology, in addition to building automated systems that, that are uh, sort of increasing it, the efficiency on the user end, allow us to to be smarter in, in terms of making a smart grid uh, so that we don't need to to have uh, so much energy at, at all times and and that's also moving in a positive direction and lowering what the utility companies uh, need to provide yeah well and interesting too because um kind of maybe on top of that as a quasi segue but um with different incentives to try to you know implement either some new technologies or specifically there was um questions associated with this incentives for tenants. One of the questions asked, uh, and Marta, maybe I'll throw this to you because you talked about one specific use case with tenant engagement. Um, if there's any incentives that tenants use uh, to use less than building average amounts of electricity, maybe with reduced rates that you've seen as an example or any other kind of specifics. From what I've seen on, on utility incentives with tenants, if the tenant is is the name on the utility bill like they get the incentive dollars so a lot of times tenants don't necessarily realize that and there's an opportunity for the owner and tenant to have some sort of cost share for improvements in their space uh in a in a way that benefits both parties uh, so that's one thing that um, can be can be helpful otherwise um 
when it comes to encouraging tenants and incentivizing them to, to reduce their usage and, and have behavioral change, uh, I'm actually going to pass it to Natalie since she mentioned the app that, mm -hmm. that Hudson Pacific passed. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, that's been really fun, actually. So last year we rolled out a mobile app across all of our, our entire multi-tenant portfolio um, where you can, you can download the app and you can see all of the amenities that you're building and you can get notifications for the health and safety protocols that we're putting in place due to the pandemic. That's really why we actually accelerated our rollout was due to health um, concerns. Um, you can get push notifications also for, for safety. So for example, when they're were really large protests outside our properties last summer, right after the George Floyd murders, we were sending push notifications, letting people know this gate is closed, that gate is open, there's extra security over here, or we're closing early. Um, so we, we use it for all sorts of um, different ways, but it's proven to be a really great tool for sustainability as well. Um, so we've done things like um, secure deals with recs, a rec provider, a consumer facing rec provider, and they agreed to give 30 bucks off um, the first month of a rec contract with anybody who signed up through us. Um, and so we promoted that through the app and we've, um, so people have been able to convert their homes to renewable electricity um, based on the, the incentive that we've been able to broker for them. Um, we've done, we've sent tips about, you know, zero waste and waste sorting and composting and that things that are general and also very specific to the building. Um, so it's a very fun way to engage people and especially critical right now when a lot, most of our people are not actually in the office, we have to engage them virtually. It's a whole new way of, uh, of engagement, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, well, I know we're getting close to the end of time. There was one other question that I actually thought was really interesting that I wanted to throw out there. It's a little bit switch in, in mindset. Um, and Kylie, maybe I'll throw it over to you because you talked about it a little bit, but um, someone had mentioned, um, is it true that no country is meeting the Paris Agreement goals at this time? Um, and can we expect them to in the future? So kind of a sad statement, but maybe there's something positive <laughs> we can end yeah. with it on be encouraging <laughs> to get it sure. ahead here. Sure, and this is in reference, um, I believe, to the CCPI 2021 report. That's the Climate Change Performance Index. They do they do an annual report where they assess uh, those that have signed on to the Paris Climate Accord and rate their findings. And yes, they did rate that not not a single country was doing enough to be considering that it would meet the uh, the necessary changes to only have global temperatures rise by 1.5 degrees Celsius. That is a very strict definition. They looked at policies. The top three performers were unsurprisingly, it was uh, Sweden, uh, Denmark, and I think the UK. Uh, Morocco was up there. There's a lot of performers up there. And and yeah, that sounds a little dire, uh, but at the same time, over half of the countries that they surveyed had had a reduction in emissions. So things are moving in the right direction. What they're really trying to make sure is that there's robust policies behind it, less on the green washing, that there's more scrutiny. And we already are seeing actions on the country level to help support some of that. Um, so the EU, for instance, has new ESG disclosures that are going to be required. Uh, that's the kind of thing to make sure performance is moving in the right direction. Also, everything that we were talking about of what the market is shifting, what it's going to look like, as Marta said, in 10 years, this conversation is going to be completely different. So we're going to see just more prevalence of green utility options that you can switch to. Right now, it's really hard to make an impact when you're kind of hampered by maybe a very regional approach. So what's on the West Coast, that's going to be across the board, for instance, and then certainly in other markets as well, too. Uh, so I think the future is bright. Yes, there's not nearly as much being done right now, but I also don't think it was ever going to be a linear progression. I think it was always going to be, this is the time that we're investing in new technologies, we're understanding full impact, and then we'll pay the dividends uh, a lot more in the future. Uh, so ho hopefully that's an optimistic enough note to end things on um no i i think that's perfect and maybe just as a, a final kind of closing statement then of um maybe from both N natalie and, and marta i mean natalie you were able to like we said you took us from 2025 to 2020 it can be done um any other kind of closing thoughts to to keep in mind we'll start with you and then maybe marta you'll be last here <laughs> Um, well, perhaps you kind of mentioned the term greenwashing. I think a lot of people in my position are concerned about moving too quickly and then perhaps getting accused of greenwashing um, or, or setting goals that perhaps they can't meet. And then do they, is there backlash, backlash for that? And I will share for, uh, that personally, 
I had so many of those concerns and stayed up awake at night the night before we announced going carbon neutral, just not knowing if we were going to have any pushback. And there was none, nothing, nothing other than like complete positive feedback for, for doing our best, even though it's not a perfect strategy yet. So um, I think hopefully that's comforting to others in a similar position. I think that's a great comfort at the end of the day. So I like hearing that. Um, and Marta, maybe here with our, our last few seconds, any other thoughts on your end? I would say that more and more real estate overall is paying attention to ESG. They're investing in ESG. They're setting ambitious goals on ESG. And so the, the future is bright in that sense as well. Um, we are not no longer seeing real estate as a, a small, small percentage paying attention to sustainability. Now the folks who aren't paying attention are the minority. And so seeing that shift is certainly heartening for the future. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I personally thought this was a great conversation, great information to share. Um, we appreciate everyone that joined us today. And there was a few people that asked about access to the slides. So we will be sharing that with participants as well as recording as well. Um, but thank you, everyone. Um, we appreciate the questions and the time. And have a great rest of your day and start to 2021. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone.